Let's take a look at uh, congenital renal pathology. With embryology, there are certain components that we're going to derive so that we uh, are able to give it proper clinical relevance. Now from the top, here we have an embryo. And uh, with this embryo, what exactly is going on? Well, all I'm trying to do here is make sure that you have a global picture as to where you can expect certain pathologies to appear. And then when the time is right, depending as to which organ system, we will dive into further detail if and when necessary. But to begin with, number one, you see that? That is connecting to the outside world. It's connecting the urinary bladder out into the umbilical cord. Hmm, interesting. It's called allantois. And the remnant of it, a uracus, if it was to remain, at some point in time, if there was enough irritation taking place, there is a particular cancer that you can develop in the urinary bladder with a persistent uracus, in which we then refer to this being, you have any idea? It is not squamous cell cancer of urinary bladder. If it was smoking, it would be transitional cell cancer of urinary bladder. Because this is glandular in nature, it would actually be adenocarcinoma of the urinary bladder. Unbelievable, isn't it? You thought it was good enough just to know smoking and transitional cell cancer of the urinary bladder? Mm, not so much. Maybe you thought, and from microbiology, that you want to know about schistosomiasis and uh, know that it was going to give rise to squamous cell cancer of urinary bladder. Well, here, embryologically, a remnant of the arachis could result in, pathologically, at some point in time, adenocarcinoma of the urinary bladder. Fascinating. Abdominal wall, number two, and penis. We're thinking about the epispadia. Stop there for one second. When you say epispadia, what does that refer to? That'll be the top of the penis. But what do you actually call that? The dorsum of the penis. You want to use the same concept for the foot. When you dorsiflex, dorsiflex what is your foot doing? It's coming up like this, isn't it? Right? And so therefore, the dorsum of the penis, and if it was to be open, epispadia, then you're worried about a particular complication called urinary bladder extrophy, E and E. At some point, when we talk about hypospadia, a completely different discussion. But that would be the ventral aspect of the penis. This is going to be the dorsal. I need you to know proper anatomical terminology. Anus, imperfect. So I mean to say if you have an imperfect anus, that could result in interesting complications. Now the kidney. The kidney, there are a couple of things that I wish to point out to you. The metanephros that you're seeing here means that it is the permanent kidney. T, metanephros, permanent kidney. Whereas the mesonephros will be, well, when we talk about this in the, uh, next, uh, in the next bullet point here, then with the me mesonephros, that would be more or less your interim. But in the meantime, though, the metanephros permanently... And on the subsequent slide, I'll show you a picture of where the inferior poles of your kidney are then going to fuse together. And it's actually more common than one would think, rendering the patient susceptible to kidney stones and the fact that it get, may get trapped underneath the inferior mesenteric artery. Use the inferior pole as being the most common place of fusion, as I shall show you, along with the inferior mesenteric artery, I and I, so that you have a point of reference. Now, internal genitalia. Now, this is a wonderful discussion when the time is right, embryologically, of a condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome. You might have known this as being testicular feminization syndrome. Androgen insensitivity syndrome is a much better clinical term, and literally, the androgens are not able to properly work on the receptors, hence the name insensitivity. So, what's happening? Well, if your androgen is not properly working on the receptor because that's the problem, then how in the world are you able to develop any of the proper male sexual structures? You cannot. And this is the patient in which, uh, well, phenotypically, he looks like a perfect phenotypic female in which upon pelvic examination, there is the vagina, but it ends up in a blind pouch because there isn't a uterus. 
there are no ovaries. Androgen sensitivity syndrome, what is your patient? And genotypically a male, XY. Move on. Here we have abdominal wall. What if you had an opening of the abdominal wall? Number six. It's called emphalocele. Hmm? Emphalocele. Urethra. Slow down for one second. Do not rush past this. With urethra, embryologically or congenitally, say that you have something called posterior valves. So think about where the urethra is. There's only one urethra. What do I mean? How many ureters do you have? Two ureters. Why am I bringing this up? Because say that you had a posterior valve issue in a young boy. And what ends up happening? Urine is not moving forward. If the, move, if the urine isn't moving forward through the urethra, what will then happen? It'll back up. Back up into what? Urinary bladder. I want you to keep backing up. Into where? One or two ureters. Both bilateral urethral issues. So later on, when we do male reproductive pathology, and we further get into issues about, um, you've heard of vesicoureteral reflux when the time is right, and when we talk about bilateral versus unilateral urethral obstruction, this is going to be a quite common young male with having bilateral urethral issues. Everything we just talked about here, one through seven, is going to be reviewed at some point in time. But isn't it nice to have everything in one place where you can actually see as to how things are developing and giving it a clinical tag? We take a look at this, and this is a horseshoe kidney. Take a look at that picture right there. You see that in the middle? That's a horseshoe. What happened? The inferior poles got fused. What do you think it got trapped under? The inferior mesenteric artery. How often does this occur? Quite, and we'll get into that in further detail, but I'd like for you to, once again, put this into context as to what this could be part of in terms of a syndrome. You all have heard of vectoral, V, vertebral anomaly, A, anal issues, cardiac issues, TE, put them together, tracheoesophageal fistula, in gastroenterology, we've talked about the most common type of tracheoesophageal fistula in which there's going to be proximal esophageal atresia and distal esophageal fistula. 85, 90% of your patients have that type of abnormality that we have discussed in gastroenterology. Ah, here's my renal. The renal abnormality that you find here with Vactoro, remember please, when you have one congenital pathology, you have many, 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 many others. So, you can't just say that you have just, for example, uh, well, this is one, but then later on we'll talk about uh, another one with Wilms tumors, okay, WT1 especially. And there's another one called uh, Colobama. And with Colobama, that'll be part of what, something called charge. Okay, so keep in mind that, and, and, and for example, even Down syndrome, right? Down syndrome, apart from the fact that your patient might be intellectually disabled, there's going to be heart issues, right? There's going to be all other types of issues as well. You get my point. So whenever you have one congenital issues, understand that, that there might be many other congenital issues concomitantly. So the renal abnormality that I want you to pay attention to here is not renal cell carcinoma. This is not Wilms tumor. This is going to be something like perhaps a horseshoe kidney. And then limb abnormalities. And the limb anomaly here would be something more so commonly found with the radius. Welcome to Vactral. We're looking at a horseshoe kidney. Could be, could be a manifestation of an acronym such as V-A-C-T-E-R-L. Let's move on. So this horseshoe kidney, the inferior poles have been fused. It gets trapped by what? Take a look at inferior mesenteric artery, highlight or keep in mind, I, inferior pole, I, inferior mesenteric artery. You are now prone to renal stones, partial fusion, as may occur, and you might actually have normal, normal functioning. Keep that in mind. Oftentimes part of autopsy. Horseshoe kidney, most common congenital kidney disorder. Majority of your fusion will be taking place with the inferior poles. Trapped behind by what? Inferior mesenteric artery. Clinical finding, maybe perhaps part of Turner syndrome. So with Turner syndrome, even without even officially introducing Turner syndrome, which we will when we talk about reproductive pathology, well, you have an XO syndrome. We talked about coarctation of aorta already. We already talked about webbing of the neck. We'll bring that up again. Later on, we'll talk about the um, streak ovaries known as dysgerminoma. 
We brought into play the aortic valve, which only has two cusps, the bicuspid, may result in a young patient that has what? Aortic stenosis. And here, congenitally, could result in renal issues. What are you worried about? Infection and stone formation. Might not have proper, proper excretion. Now, say that a patient, a child, excuse me, yeah, well, your patient is a child here and uh, is only born with one kidney. One in 1,000. Look how common that is. So one in 1,000 newborn infants only have one functioning kidney. Is this child going to die? Thank goodness, no. Bad enough that diseases occur in general, but when a disease occurs in a child, not good. That doesn't make me feel very good, and, and neither should you. But this is a good story. So when you have one kidney, understand that your patient is going to be working or the kidney function will be quite normal. Boys are affected more so than girls. The left kidney is usually the one that's absent. Left kidney. Left kidney is a little special in other ways as well. And anatomically, remember, the left kidney, when it wants to drain its blood, will be moving through the left renal vein. It is then going to hook up with the left gonadal vein. And if it's a boy, obviously the left testicular. And then it's going to move on to the inferior vena cava. That is not how it works on the right side, is it? The inferior vena cava, because it's more proportioned on the right side, you have a renal vein that will directly connect with the inferior vena cava. So the left kidney is rather interesting in that manner, and we'll talk about a few other issues later on with renal cell carcinoma. In this case, the left kidney is absent much more so. Well, what about the other kidney? There's only one left. It'll undergo something called compensatory hypertrophy. And that's amazing, actually, because even when you do renal transplants, and with renal transplants, that dead kidney is usually left within the patient because it's too difficult to take out because the kidney is uh, retroperitoneal. And uh, you're going to then insert a new kidney from the anterior side. And when you do so, it's amazing to watch this kidney grow. Really, quite fascinating. And so here, with unilateral renal, renal agenesis, the body knows, the kidney knows. And so therefore, it'll undergo compensatory hypertrophy and performs the function of the missing kidney. Versus Potter syndrome. What do you mean, versus? In our previous discussion, we just talked about unilateral renal agenesis. Let's go on to talk about bilateral renal agenesis. Ah, the story, not so good, huh? Not so good. Let me walk you through this. You'll like this. I'm here to give you clinical information. I'm, I'm trying to give you how you can identify your patient the quickest so that you can come up with the proper diagnosis and implement management when necessary. The management here, uh, not a whole lot that you can do, really. And what's happening? Well, here, both the kidneys are missing. When? In utero. In utero. So the fetus within the pregnant woman is missing both kidney. I need you to think of amniotic fluid and its circulation as being very, very primitive and simple for learning purposes, okay? Now, if you want to know more, then you do that on your own time. But for right now, for, for, for the sake of time, we need to make sure that we go through this effectively. Okay, so what's happening? Amniotic fluid is what you're thinking of. This is a fetus. This is a fetus that is going to be consuming the amniotic fluid, which contains the nutrients that it requires, it is then going to, quote-unquote, urinate the amniotic fluid. It is a continuous cycle, a continuous cycle. Now, what does it mean to have uh, amniotic fluid in your placenta? It, you call this amnios, right? Amnios. Then you can have two different clinical manifestations upon ultrasound, a ligo or too much, pale. So pale or ligo. Well, you do an ultrasound on this pregnant woman, and you find that the amniotic fluid, amnios, it's too little. What is, what is, which one's too little? The poly or the oligo? Oligo is too little, isn't it? You've heard of oliguria, oligomenorrhea, oligohydramnios. So you have oligohydramnios. What happened? Both the kidneys aren't present in the fetus. Oh, not good. So what's happening? You don't have as much amniotic fluid that's being, quote unquote, urinated out. Think of it as such, please, so that you never miss this question. Now what happens? Now, the devastation begins. Hmm? What do I mean by that? This amniotic fluid is not present. The placenta is now crushing the fetus, crushing it. My world is caving in upon me everywhere. So what does that mean? Flattened facies, 
recessed chin, low set ears. What about the lungs? Good. Hypoplasia. Welcome to Potter's Sequence. Not a single thing did you need to memorize here, except for maybe the name Potter. But everything else, bilateral renoigenesis, then it's a story. Oligohydromnios, you have a very small world that this fetus is living in to the point it's crushing the baby. You're going to have what we just talked about, where you have flattened facies, recessed chin, flattened nose, and we have pulmonary hypoplasia. Death. Not good. Potter syndrome. So what's happening along with this? Well, I need you to think of um, the development of the kidney as being two stages. Okay? What does a diverticulum mean to you? An outpouching. Tell me a couple important places in pathology where diverticulum becomes quite common for us. Well, we might have a diverticulum in the esophagus, and that's called zinker diverticulum. You might have a diverticulite down in the intestine uh, for a couple of reasons. Maybe it's Meckel's diverticulum, hmm? and that'll be a remnant of the vitellin duct. You with me? Or you could have a diverticulum because in the Western diet, we have lots of consumption of meat with perhaps only a little bit of fiber. So you're sitting there going all of the time and constipated. That's a lot of pressure that you're putting in the intestine. Could I be any more dramatic? So what happens in intestine? Down by the left lower quadrant, you might have whew, an outpouching, a diverticulum. So what is a diverticulum? My question stands, is an outpouching. So with the kidney, you'll have the uretric bud. I want you to close your eyes. Think of the ureter, and that is being developed by the metanephric diverticulum. It is an actual outpouching, ureteric bud, that is then going to come in, and it is going to hook up with the blastema. That's your metanephrogenic blastema. Now, what does that mean to you? The ureteric bud, which is the diverticulum, at least get that out of the way, is going to give rise to the distal portion of the nephron. So that'll be your ureter, that'll be the uh, calluses, and that'll be, you know, all the stuff that's going on in the pelvis. Whereas the metanephric genic blastema is going to give rise to the proximal portion of the nephron. What may then happen if the two are not going to properly uh, meet? And there you have it. You have a diverticulum, which is then going to punch a hole into the blastema. And as long as those two are going to communicate, you have a perfectly formed communicative nephron. What if it doesn't happen? Well, if it doesn't happen, then the kidney is not functioning properly. It is as simple as that. I need you to know from embryo and congenitally these two structures and what it represents, please. It's amazing as to how many different times that it will come into play. Now, at some point, when we get into uh, what we're seeing here with the letters and such, for example, here's letter A. And that then gives you the two different components that are not united. What two components? The diverticulum, the ureteric bud, a.k.a., and then the blastema. And then by the time you get to letter D, you'll notice that there's perfect communication between the diverticula and the blastema. That's all that I wish for you to take out of this particular illustration. If you want to know further detail, then here it is for your uh, preference. <laughs>